Good morning. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for in the first place. I, I just wanted to add uh, to the introduction. I've added a few more co-authors to my talk because I'm going to uh, talk about the research I did uh, over the last few years with, with uh, others as well. So just wanted to have them uh, recognized. I think the title of my talk is kind of uh, self-explanatory. And uh, equally, I think uh, uh, I don't need to uh, explain too much why, why we need to, to look at the, the, the problem of uncertainty models are increasingly used to support decisions. And so there is also a lot of discussion about how do we, um, where do these models take their credibility from given all the uncertainties they are uh, affected by. And uh, I just thought I'd throw a few examples, not even from the scientific community. This is all example of blogs or journal articles that uh, came up uh, uh, recently from companies or even the, the one on the bottom is from The Guardian talking about these problems of, okay, we use models, but uh, uh, their predictions are wrong. <laughs> so what do we do with that? And I think now going into a bit more of, of the, sci uh, the science uh, of it, I think the questions I would like to uh, discuss today are, are essentially three. So in the first place, how do we uh, go about uh, validations of uh, models of open systems, such as environmental ones, uh, when uh, the, 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 the model ability to fit uh, the data um, might not be a, an applicable or any way sufficient uh, uh, criterion. And the reason is, uh, well, there are two main uh, reasons for this. Uh, there is also a lot of literature uh, on, on this. Uh, um, so in, in the first place with, with environmental systems, we have the problem that uh, our knowledge of processes in itself is limited. So differently from traditional physics where we have a theory and then we build a model to uh, confirm or reject the theory, we are in a situation where the theory underpinning the model somehow evolves uh, together with the model. And second, because uh, we don't, uh, the data that we use uh, to, to test and build a force and test the model are not the data that we obtain in, in a lab through controlled experiments. It's data that we collect out there in the environment when we can. And so there are a lot of errors in this data and gaps and uh, and sometimes we just don't have uh, data at all. Um, then the second question I would like to, to discuss is the questions of, okay, even if we have a model that we believe to be valid or good enough, uh, how do we use it when uh, we want to make pro the, um, projections of long-term uh, evolution of, uh, of the system? And here the problem is that the, the, the input scenarios that we use to force our model are, deeply uncertain. So uh, the range of responses that we can get is so large that it's a bit uh, unclear how useful then they might be for, for any type of uh, decision making. And, um, and the third question I want to, to look at is the question of, okay, how do we make, uh, increasingly we, we want to, to also use models to make uh, predictions at, uh, at larger spatial scales. And, um, and so how do we do that, uh, again, with limited amount of data and perhaps also limited uh, computing resources? And uh, my, my argument, our argument that I would like to develop in this talk is that uh, I think we, we can design computer experiments uh, that can enable us to extract uh, information about the model behavior and help us with uh, the evaluation of, of the models. And equally, we can also use uh, uh, this kind of computer experiment to extract uh, information about the system behavior under change, under the assumption that the model is, is being deemed a good enough representation of the real system. And also we can then map, map back this information into space to produce uh, larger scale predictions. And, and the point is that I think uh, what I want to kind of showcase is that there, are, there is a common methodology uh, for running these computer experiments in a structured way. In my community, this is usually called global sensitivity analysis. And 
uh, I want to give a couple of examples of how we might use this methodology to uh, begin to address uh, this, uh, these questions. So my first example is uh, from uh, uh, a, a number of studies that we developed on modeling uh, groundwater in uh, karst systems. So karst systems are uh, hydrological systems where there is a uh, characterized by uh, the presence of carbonate rocks, which means that essentially there is this vertical preferential flow. A lot of the um, of, of the water uh, that gets into the system is transformed into uh, recharge to the groundwater more than in non car systems. And then on the other end, then the, the surface runoff is typically less than uh, cast system. And these type of systems are, 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 are uh, very common in, in Europe and they sustain in, in many places um, water supply for, uh, for agriculture and uh, for, uh, for the domestic and uh, industrial uh, consumption. So uh, it is important to be able to look at how these systems might evolve, uh, uh, particularly under climate change or possibly under land use. Uh, change and, and because of this specific characteristic of, of the systems we can't use uh, hydrological models that we uh, that uh, that we would use in non karst uh, systems so uh, over time we we developed uh, uh, this uh, um, parsimonious model uh, for karst uh, this is just the most recent uh, uh, paper that, uh, that uh, complete the, the, the development of, uh, of this model. And, uh, and so I want to uh, show in the first place how we went about uh, the, the evaluation of uh, the model, uh, the model in the lack of, uh, in the lack of uh, very many uh, uh, data. And uh, so talking about uh, data, let's say that the standard approach to, to model evaluation typically is, uh, is, uh, it's been a database, uh, what I've called here a database evaluation. So we have data and we look at whether the model, uh, the model outputs are consistent with observations uh, of, uh, that, that, that we have of, uh, of, that, uh, of that variable. Well, this is obviously more than reasonable, but, uh, but the problem is what do we do when, when we don't have data? Like in, in, the, in this case, the, the variable we want to predict is, is concentrated and diffuse recharge, and typically we have very little observations of, of uh, these variables. And so to just uh, make the claim that the model is good because it does uh, reasonably fit those uh, few and sparse data is probably insufficient. And the other problem is if we were to use these models to look into the long-term future under climate change, perhaps the model ability to reproduce historical data is not really the only, um, is not really sufficient because the future might be different from the past in a uh, non-stationary world. So what we propose here is uh, to, to complement the database evaluation with what we call the response-based evaluation. So we kind of, uh, stress test our model and look at, uh, uh, investigate what is the input output response of the model and ask the question, is it consistent with our perceptual model? So our understanding of the system. And, uh, and as I said, we have a structured approach based on sampling the model input factor and running model, model uh, uh, simulations, perhaps in the Monte Carlo frameworks to address uh, uh, this question, and then we have a set of techniques to look at, to analyze this input-output data and, and uh, answer the question, which input factors mostly control the output variability, when and where, and then we can see whether this is plausible, whether this is as expected. So a quick example from, from this CARS model is, is uh, like this, we have, uh, this is the result of this final analysis of the model simulations, we have the input parameters on the horizontal, some of them relate to vegetation, some of them relate to the soil properties. And these uh, bars are what we call these uh, sensitivity indices. And the higher this bar, the more that particular input of the model controls the, uh, the model output, so the groundwater recharge. And we repeat the exercise at two different sites. One that is uh, in, a, in a more humid climate and one in a more semi-arid climate. 
And, um, and why this is uh, interesting? Because for example, in this example, we see that in the humid site, the vegetation parameters are uh, much more important than, than in a semi-arid site. And this is, this is consistent with our understanding of uh, how of the role of vegetation in uh, uh, energy limited um, places versus uh, water limited places. So we gain uh, confidence in the fact that uh, the model behaves consistently with our understanding of, of uh, the system. And then once we have kind of uh, established that we are sufficiently uh, happy of, of this model, we can uh, move on into instead, as I was saying earlier, looking into the future, looking at questions like what, uh, what are the key controls of uh, this uh, system? Uh, is it uh, climate or, for example, land cover change in this, uh, in this case? And again, we can do, we can answer this question with a similar methodology. This time, rather than just varying the, 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 the model parameter, we will also vary the force in the input to consider a range of possible uh, climate scenarios and land cover scenarios. And, uh, and again, we get some important uh, sensitivity indices. We can do this uh, for different uh, uh, type of landscape across Europe. And so what we see is, for example, the increasing role of uh, land cover change, it's, it's uh, increasing importance in, in more humid climate and instead the, the more important role of, of climate in, uh, in a more arid uh, climate. And also uh, I have highlighted with a circle this, uh, this component in the landscape, in the desert landscape, because this is interesting. This is our residual uncertainty around the, the model parameters. And so this is telling us essentially that, uh, that in, in this particular landscape, our uh, lack of knowledge about the characteristic of the system is such that the kinds of uh, might, uh, might actually uh, overtake our ability to distinguish, uh, for example, the role of, of uh, land cover. And, uh, and similarly, I, I just want to, to very quickly show, I don't want to go into the details, but, uh, uh, we can also use this kind of methodology to identify those thresholds that uh, some people mentioned yesterday, uh, threshold that uh, could lead to a shift in system response. Again, we do this by simply analyzing this input-output uh, data set that we possess. And I don't want to go into the details of how this, uh, this is a this uh, um, CART uh, um, algorithm works, but just to say we, we, we can begin to identify uh, this threshold. And so here the question is not uh, what, uh, what uh, will happen to, to the car system, but basically what are the conditions in terms of climate and land cover uh, property that will lead to a certain outcome in terms of water recharge. Um, just want to briefly mention another, another example, uh, this time from a different, from a different uh, uh, perspective, per, from a different problem, the problem of looking at uh, landslide hazard. Again, we, we develop uh, a parsimonious model to look at uh, uh, the probability for a slope to fail in response uh, to a given uh, uh, rainfall event. And, uh, and uh, we can, again, use this, uh, these models uh, within our uh, global sensitivity analysis framework and analyze what are the, the, the system characteristics that uh, drive uh, landslide failure. And so, for example, in this case, what we find is that uh, it, it's a set of uh, slope properties, soil properties, and rainfall properties that mainly control uh, the probability of, of our uh, failure. And, uh, and then, an interesting point, I want to just uh, very quickly go through this. We can then uh, use these uh, uh, controls of, of, of uh, our system to basically map the back, this is an application to St. Lucia in the Caribbean, uh, so, uh, map back where uh, landslide failure might, uh, might happen. And so we can produce maps of this kind where we have the landslide probability 
for example, for a given event, in this case, Hurricane Thomas, which is an event that happened a few years ago, and then ask questions of, okay, what if uh, uh, we were having a, a, a storm that was, uh, for example, 10% more severe, and we see how many of the slope units in, in our domain uh, are predicted to then become unstable. And then uh, similarly, we can ask the question, what if instead uh, urbanization were to increase, increasing uh, the, the hazard of, of the slopes? Or what happens if both the drivers, uh, land, uh, climate and uh, urbanization were affecting our system? So in conclusion, uh, the, 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 the key points I wanted to, uh, to make is that uh, we need uh, better models as much as we need uh, better ways uh, to evaluate models. And, uh, uh, and we can use uh, computer experiments uh, based on propagation of uncertainties and analysis of synthetic input output data, such as this methodology that I've called uh, global sensitivity analysis uh, to learn about models as much as we, uh, they, they can teach us about systems. And, uh, and then I just wanted to mention, we have a set of uh, papers and open source uh, software that we are happy to share to perform some of these analysis. Thank you.